Hello and welcome to Medical Botany. People used plants for over 4,000 years for medicinal purposes. Why is in today's day and age the knowledge and understanding of medicinally essential plants still relevant? Not too long ago, the World Health Organization estimated that about 80% of people worldwide rely on herbal medicines for at least some aspect of their primary health care. According to the World Health Organization, more than 20,000 plant species possess the potential to be utilized as medicinal plants. Plants have been an essential part of medical treatments long before the prehistoric period. Classical Unani manuscript of today's India, Egyptian papyrus, and Chinese records describe the use of plants in therapeutic applications. In the book, The Divine Farmer's Classic of Materia Medica, Shen Nong Ben Zhao Jing, a Chinese book on agriculture and medical plants, which is a compilation of oral traditions written between 200 and 250 of the current area. This book is now available in an English translation. In indigenous cultures, in the Roman Empire, Egypt, Persia, Africa, and America used herbs in their healing rituals. Here we see a translation of the Ebers papyrus. They describe a remedy to open the bowels by mixing milk, sycamore fruit, honey, boil them together and strain it and administer it for four days. There is another remedy where colocynth, honey are mixed together and eaten by the man in one day. Another remedy to empty the belly and expel putrefaction in the belly of a man. Seeds of rhizomus are chewed and swallowed with beer until all that is in his belly comes out. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Over the last centuries, scientists were interested in medicinal plants from all over the world. As this book review from the 1930s of a book that was first published in 1596 shows us. Now, let's take a look at a few plants that are detrimental for human health. Here we see the poison ivy. You all might have heard of leaves of three, let it be. That's a little bit of a truism. However, we know several plants that have three leaflets. So these are not leaves of three, but this is one leaf that is divided into three lobes and we call them leaflets in botany. Anyway, so we know several plants with three leaflets that are poisonous. The one poisonous plant that most people in West Virginia know is Toxicodendron radicans. It is a woody wine or small shrub in the sumac family. It is very variable in its leaf appearance. The plant on the left has roundish leaflets with no clear indention, whereas the plant on the right shows clear indentions. In this plant, we also see the greenish-white inconspicuous berries. In the fall, poison ivy leaves change their color and actually look quite beautiful. However, if you ever have the misfortune to walk into poison ivy and not wash your skin directly afterwards, this is what might happen to you. Poison ivy rash is a type of contact dermatitis that is caused by an oily resin called orochiol. This oil is found in the leaves, stems and roots of poison ivy, but also of poison oak and poison sumac. This resin is very sticky, so it easily attaches to the skin, but also to clothing, tools, equipment, and also pet's fur. 
we know two types of poison oak. The Atlantic poison oak and the Pacific poison oak. They both belong to the same species. However, they live in different habitats. The Atlantic poison oak is native to the southeastern United States. And the Pacific poison oak is found from the California Peninsula up to British Columbia. Poison sumac is a woody shrub or a small tree. It grows exclusively in wet areas. Here in West Virginia, you will find it, for example, in the Dolly Sots. Another plant that can cause a dermatitis is giant hawkweed. It is sometimes also called the plant from hell. The sap of giant hawkweed is phototoxic. So direct contact with the plant sap will not immediately lead to a rash, but the plant sap prevents the skin from being able to protect itself from sunlight. This leads to phytophotodermatitis, a serious skin inflammation. If you come in contact with the sap and wash it off immediately, most likely nothing bad will happen. However, as soon as 15 minutes after exposure, a phototoxic reaction can begin. The photosensitivity peaks between 30 minutes and 2 hours after contact with the plant, but can last as long as several days. In this picture down here on the right, you see a typical photodermatitis reaction. First aid after contact with the plant sap is to wash it off immediately and if this is not possible to protect the skin from sunlight and then wash it off as soon as possible. A typical look-alike to the giant hawkweed is cow parsnip. Now giant hawkweed is not native to the United States. Its native habitat is in Eastern Europe or Eurasia. Now cow parsnip can be found in the United States and those pictures here are plants that I've observed in Alaska. Cow parsnip was part of the diet of indigenous North Americans. They used the young stems and leaf stalks, peeled them and ate them raw and this gives the plant the common name Indian celery. This plant was also used to treat bruises and sores. However, similar to the giant hawkweed, the sap of co-parsnip is phototoxic and can cause photodermatitis. However, since the sap is only activated by UV light, the skin reactions are usually milder. Co-parsnip sap contains fewer coronamarin. These compounds can enter the epidermal cells. Epidermal cells are skin cells and will react with the DNA in the nucleus. UV exposure will lead to cross-linking of the furanochromarins with the DNA, leading to a fast cell death, resulting in photodermatitis. The stinging nettle, Ortica dioica, is a common weed native to Europe, but it is naturalized in the northern parts of the United States. The stems and the leaf of stinging nettles are covered by structures that look like hairs, but these structures are delicate and hollow. Those hairs act like little needles when they come into contact with the skin. This contact can cause a wide range of cutaneous reactions. Orticaria, or the stinging nettle rash, occurs when the skin comes into contact with those stinging nettles. The released chemicals act to cause itching, dermatitis, and the already mentioned urticaria within moments of contact. Those little needles release histamines and other substances. The rash usually disappears within 24 hours. Extract from the stinging nettles may provide therapeutic value for some inflammatory medical conditions. It is often a home remedy against rheumatoid arthritis. 
In this picture, you actually see the arm of my son who wanted to try out the, skin, the stinging nettle. You might have heard of the assassination of the Bulgarian dissident Georgi Markov. He defected from Bulgaria in 1968. He then worked as a broadcaster and journalist for stations such as BBC World Service, the US-funded Radio Free Europe, and the West Germans Deutsche Welle. In 1978, Markov was murdered with a poison-filled pellet shot into his leg at a bus stop in Great Britain. The weapon was most likely a type of umbrella gun. The pellet contained rising. Rising is produced in the seeds of the castor oil plant. It, conta it contains two toxic elements. One penetrates the cells of the body and creates a passage for the second toxin, a lectin. This lectin binds to carbohydrates, impairing the cell's ability to produce proteins and thus killing the cell. Traditionally, fungi are taught together with plants in botany. Of course, fungi are not plants, but we'll cover a few fungi in this class. So what we see here is the death angel, Amanita ocreata. It is one of the most poisonous fungi in Northern America. You might have already seen pictures of the fly agaric, Amanita muscaria, which is common in Europe. Consumption of any of these fungi usually leads to liver failure and is very often fatal. The fly agaric got its name, this is according to my mom who told me this story, is because that in some rural regions, little pieces of this fly agaric were placed into milk in a little bowl and this bowl was then placed on the top of a high cupboard. The flies drink the milk, become inebriated and die. So this was a very early form of an insecticide. Imagine you are living in the Middle Ages, so let's travel back in time and you find yourself with an awful headache. Now, there's no pharmacy where you can go to and get some headache medication. However, there was help. I'm sure you have heard of aspirin or acetylic salicylic acid, which is commonly used as a pain reliever for minor aches and pains and also as a fever reducer. It is also an anti-inflammatory drug and can be used as a blood thinner. Aspirin contains salicylate, which derives from willow bark. Its use was first recommended around 400 before the current era, in the time of Hippocrates, when people chewed willow bark to relieve inflammation and fever. Another plant you might have heard of is colothinth. The synonyms are bitter apple, bitter cucumber, desert gourd, or also the wine of Sodom, and it has been mentioned in the Bible. Colothinth has been widely used in traditional medicine. It was used as a laxative, diuretic, and for insect bites. And in traditional Arab veterinary medicine, the sap of colothinth was used to treat skin eruptions of camels. There are some serious safety concerns. However, colocynth is still used for diabetes, high cholesterol, and blood fat reduction. It is also used in combination with other products to treat liver and gallbladder ailments. Here we see foxglove. Foxglove is a plant that is native to Europe, but has been naturalized in mainly the northern parts of the United States and especially the West Coast. The use of a foxglove extract, a digitalis purpurea extract, 
for the treatment of heart conditions was first described in the English-speaking medical literature by William Withering in 1785. Digitalis extract contains cardioglycosides. These glycosides increase the output force of the heart and decrease its rate of contraction. They influence the sodium potassium ATPase pumps and those glycosides are used to treat congestive heart failure. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this short intro into medical botany and I hope that you all are going to enjoy this class. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me anytime. Have a great start into the semester.